The moments when you think someone else is causing the disorder and chaos that you are feeling are moments to recognize that that person is allowing you to discover that you have not yet mastered yourself. You needed a reminder that you have work to do on yourself in order to be an instrument of peace. Once again, let me remind you of a very famous line from A Course in Miracles that has always attracted me. It says, I can choose peace rather than this. It is a terrific reminder in moments when you are not being an instrument of thy peace. Write this affirmation and have it duplicated to post in strategic places in your home, workplace, and automobile. I can choose peace rather than this. When you find yourself experiencing anguish, fear, depression, turmoil, even anger, stop and repeat this line to yourself. As you ponder these seven words, make a concerted effort to bring thoughts of peace into your mind right in the midst of your mental anguish. Give yourself a specific period of time each day to be alone and undisturbed. Take a brisk walk or lock your bedroom door or leave the frantic pace of your office to go somewhere to be alone. In your precious moments of being undisturbed, say to yourself, I am letting go and letting God. What happens is that you let go of your sense of taking personal responsibility for everything and everyone around you, and in a calm way you turn all of that over to God. Your return to the noisy world will now be with a new partner, God. Make meditation a part of your daily life. Resistance to meditation is a universal phenomenon in the Western world. I hear it every day. I'm too busy. I just can't seem to quiet my mind. It doesn't work. These excuses are nothing more than your fear of coming to know God and therefore taming your demanding ego. For the next 60 days, give yourself a directive to practice meditation at least once, preferably twice a day. The technique that you use is totally up to you. All I can tell you is that when you practice meditation regularly, each session is like lifting the weight of your problems off of your shoulders and a feeling of having your soul nourished so that you approach everything with the accompaniment of thy peace. When people say to me, how can I possibly be at peace in a non-peaceful world? I always remind them that inner peace is just that, inner, not outer. You must come to the point where you bring your peace to everyone and everything, rather than attempting to secure it from outer experiences. Remember, you become what you think about all day long. Every time you bemoan the horrors of the world or listen to media reports on all that is evil, or read tabloids which exploit the unpleasant facts about others' lives, you are continuing the conditioning that takes you away from becoming an instrument of peace. When you remind yourself that for every act of evil, there are a thousand acts of kindness, you put your thoughts back on peace. When you stop someone who is relating yet another disaster story and change the tone to something more loving, you become an instrument of peace. Each day you are provided many opportunities to practice peacemaking. Just this morning, while at the mini-store waiting to pay for my gasoline, the cashier was being rude to a young man who didn't understand how the $3 car wash operated. The cashier was verbally assaulting this teenager who was asking to have his money back, which the cashier was obstinately refusing. Furthermore, the teenage boy obviously did not speak English and could not understand what he was being told, let alone why he was being the victim of the cashier's abuse. As the teenager stood there bewildered, I saw an opportunity to be a peacemaker. I put my arm around the young man, walked outside with him, and showed him how to operate the machine, which allowed him to smile for the first time since I'd encountered him. Make this the day that you practice being a peacemaker. Truly, it is in giving peace that you will receive it. Make peace with yourself. When you make peace with yourself, you take a hard look at everything you have ever done, and you remind yourself that you needed all of those experiences in order to provide you with the energy to propel yourself to a higher spiritual frequency. If you are better than you used to be, that is reason enough to make peace with yourself. All the self-reproach, guilt, disappointment, self-hatred, and anger that you direct at yourself simply take you away from peace. Get back to nature, away from the fast-paced world of high technology, investment decisions, disputes, noises, and a crowded world. Nature beckons to you. Give yourself the gift of nature as often as you can. Nature gives you peace because you are in the energy field of God. Your return to nature literally opens up a whole new set of spiritual solutions to every one of those so-called problems. As you examine the bag of troubles that are your unique problems, keep in mind three words written by St. Paul 
in his letters to the Corinthians, love never fails. Whenever I am caught in a perceived problem, sending love never fails. This holds true even in situations where hatred seems to be the problem. You can see the contending forces of good and evil, love and hatred everywhere. Many believe that these two opposing forces in the world are God versus the devil. I have spent considerable time attempting to disavow such a preposterous notion. How is it possible for both God and the devil to exist if there is only one creator and one power in the universe? If there is only one creative truth behind the universe, and you accept the devil as this truth, you are then required to believe that hatred, violence, ugliness, prejudice, disease, poverty, and chaos are manifestations of this truth, and all love and goodness are false. If you accept God as the truth, then you must accept that love is the truth and that evil is false, and hatred is surely part of that evil that is false. I perceive hate as love energy going in the opposite direction. Basically, people who seem to be spewing hate are projecting their feelings of being unloved. When you encounter someone who resents you, you can be certain that this person feels resented and is doing only what it is possible for him to do, which is giving away what he has. If you see a person who is judgmental towards you, be assured that this person is only sending out the judgment he feels directed at him. These are examples of people believing they are not loved, sending out disagreeable and hateful energy. Let's look at where hatred is encountered and how one can send love to the problems that accompany the presence of hatred. You can observe what appears to be hatred in the world in a myriad of forms. One race of people expressing their hatred by invading or mistreating other racial groups. Some people controlling food supplies while others are left to starve. A steady diet of violence force-fed to others in the form of killing, fighting, verbal abuse, and cheating. Laws passed that favor one group over another that is hated by the majority in power. When the reins of power shift, revenge toward those who were the former haters then becomes the norm. Hatred seems to beget hatred. Evil is in the mind of man. Any hate you encounter comes from the minds of people who feel disconnected from God and the flow of love energy that exists. When you buy into their hatreds, you too are disconnected. Revenge, anger, retaliation, gloom, and all of the things that you perceive as problems are mental constructs. Hatred comes from those who feel hated in some way. There are two ways you can help them to change that feeling of being hated. One, by letting people with hateful behavior see that you personally have only love to give them. And two, by your seeing that God loves them unconditionally, even though they cannot recognize that truth. You may be thinking that all of this love stuff seems too theoretical and theological to apply when you are in an encounter with someone who is directing hate your way. I assure you that the simple recognition of hatred being a form of misdirected love and a reflection that a person feels unloved is enough to disempower and release the hatred. Here is the secret for dealing with those close to you who exhibit hatred. First, remember that hatred is a reaction to frustrated love. Then silently repeat to yourself over and over, Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. The hatred you see directed outward, toward you, is actually pain being exposed by the person who is experiencing it. When the hate is dissolved, the pain loses its horror and torment. One of the most loving things you can do in response to hate is to silently send that person a blessing and remove yourself from the energy field of fear and hatred. Removing yourself from the scene is a way to keep your energy field uncontaminated and to give the hater a space to reflect on their actions in private. If someone attempts to lure you in with his or her hatred, you have a choice not to take the bait. It's like trying to pick a fight with someone who refuses to join in the fracas. The angry person is disarmed by the response of pacifism or love. Many of the so-called problems in life are the result of having to deal with others who bring hatred into the energy field. Take note of how much of the hatred infects your home, workplace, family and friends, relationships, and even your health. Then ask yourself if you contribute to the hatred by hating the haters. Problems are experienced in your thoughts first. If you have love there, you will not have room for hate, since they cannot live together. Becoming conscious of your thoughts in the face of hatred and being committed to staying in thoughts of love is the spiritual solution. It takes time, 
but gradually love will transform that hate into joy and beauty. Sowing love where hatred resides means any place where you encounter hate, even deep within yourself. Everything you have ever done for which you may carry around self-contempt is in the past. So don't spend any of today entertaining self-hate. Shift your gears into reverse and begin moving your thoughts in the direction of love. Forgiveness is the means to accomplishing this reversal. I recommend that you practice what I do each and every time I find myself in a situation where hatred is present. I repeat the line from the St. Francis prayer, Where there is hatred, let me sow love. This prayerful reminder empowers me to take actions based upon love rather than my ego's inclination to fight hatred with my own hatred. Last week, on a tennis court in the midst of a doubles match, one of the players began hurling hateful epithets at another player accusing him of cheating. The angrier he got with his verbal insults, the more the environment of the court was being poisoned. I had been writing about the prayer of St. Francis, and the reminder to sow love where there is hatred came immediately to mind. I told my partner, who was the intended recipient of the hatred, to simply say nothing in response, rather than return the insults. I suddenly said out loud for all to hear, and directly to the man who was filled with hatred, You know, we all love you, win or lose. I was surprised that I did that, but even more surprised at his response. He looked at me, smiled, and said, I'm sorry, I just lost it. It was an amazing example of sowing love in the face of hatred and seeing it disappear almost instantaneously. After any episode where hatred has been directed at you, or when you have been a silent witness to hatred, don't allow the incident to linger in your mind. Furthermore, resist the temptation to discuss the episode. When you talk about another person, Make a serious effort to send or direct loving support to their energy field. Be the person who promotes the idea that people can change. Ask everyone in your family and circle of friends to direct loving, prayerful guidance toward those who are stuck in the torment of their hatred. You've heard the expression, let's send them some positive energy. This is not fiction. It's just another way of sowing love where there is hatred. You have the power to use your loving energy this way at any time. Make a deliberate commitment to spend an unselfish hour with someone less fortunate. I guarantee that within three blocks of your home, there is someone who feels desperate and helpless. Most often, they do not know that the source of their anguish is in an absence of feeling loved. You can be the instrument of peace, sowing love for both the person and yourself. You don't have to give them money or food or anything material. Just the wonderful act of sowing love creates a spiritual solution to this problem, as well as nourishing your own soul. Your best method for deflecting hatred is to be conscious of how you react to hatred. If you immediately find yourself offended by the conduct of the hater, you have taken it personally and allowed your ego into the fray. Imagine someone saying to you, I hate you. You never give me any credit for anything. All you ever do is criticize me. You might respond with something like, you feel that I don't give you enough credit and it really makes you angry, I want you to know that I think you're able and talented and I'll work at telling you so more frequently. You've not taken anything personally and you have responded to hate with love. When you get to know the people who seem to be filled with hate, you'll discover that they want the same things you do. By getting to know someone, by spending time with them, by making a little extra effort to sow some love toward anyone from whom you feel hatred might be emanating, you create an atmosphere of openness where love has a chance to bloom. This is not only true of family members. You can go to lunch with that person who is most disrespectful to you at work, and in one hour of just being together, you'll diffuse much of the hatred. Very often it seems impossible to reach someone who is full of hate. I recommend that you make your feelings known in a letter format, so that the reader is unable to argue back with their invested hatred. Even if they disagree with everything you write, make an effort to let them know that they are important, worthwhile, and most of all, loved by you and by God. But also include how you feel when their hate is directed at you, and why you frequently remove yourself from the immediate vicinity of that hatred. By sending love in a written form, you don't fan the sparks of hatred which flare up when words are flying back and forth in heated exchanges. One of the best ways I've discovered to sow love where there is hatred is to be generous and giving in my response. Send flowers to someone who has been verbally abusive. 
mail a box of candy, or send a gift certificate in response to hatred. Forgive yourself and look upon yourself with love. All the reasons that you may have adopted to hate yourself are the result of a rigid belief that your ego is the dominant force in your life. Your ego believes you are what you do, what you have, and what others think of you. Your ego believes you are separate from everyone else and separate from God. Thus, that ego is always judging, evaluating, and comparing you to others. When you don't measure up, you engage in self-contempt. Then you review how many times you have failed and turn those self-perceived failures into self-hate. Forgive yourself and you are sowing love in your energy field as well as providing yourself with a spiritual solution to the problem of self-contempt. I know in my heart that no person can love another unless he loves humanity first. An emancipated slave who one would think had every reason to be full of hate exemplifies this message. His name was Booker T. Washington, and he put it this way, I shall allow no man to belittle my soul by making me hate him. Here was a man who went to work at the age of nine, worked as a janitor to obtain an education, and later headed up the Tuskegee Institute in Alabama. He refused to hate. Why? Because, as he said, hatred belittles the soul. Where there is injury, pardon. As you are aware, St. Francis was known as a healer of the sick. He is asking in this line of the prayer to reunite himself so completely with spirit that body and universal mind become one. He prays for the perfection of God's consciousness to permeate his body so he can convey this spiritual energy to those who are less than whole. I'm not asking you to become a St. Francis or a Jesus and perform miraculous healings. I am asking you to open yourself up to an idea that you may think of as outrageous or even impossible. I want to make very clear how I believe we can look at the presence of illness or injury in our lives and the lives of our loved ones from a perspective of implementing spiritual solutions. When we have to recognize and accept a given state of disease in our body, our primary thought ought to be how to create a solution. This generally implies returning our body to a disease-free state as quickly and as painlessly as possible. When I suggest taking responsibility for any disease and injury, I emphasize that this should be without any accompanying guilt or shame. By saying to yourself, this state of disease or imbalance is mine. I own it, and I am in charge of my attitude toward it. You acquire a sense of empowerment because you open yourself to the healing energy found in a spiritual solution. We do live in a carcinogenic world. We have pollutants in our air, food, and our water. Anger about these conditions or blaming the polluters will only serve to magnify the problem. Seeking a spiritual solution means letting go of those disempowering energies of shame and guilt and anger and blame. By saying, this is mine, and I seek the spiritual solution to this situation, you move into those higher healing energies. Your body is your curriculum to God in this lifetime. Some of us have the condition of a bald head, a short stature, eyes that don't see, ears that don't hear, legs that don't walk, and so on. The presence of injury and disease in children is particularly troublesome to contemplate. Once again, it is important to note emphatically that from a spiritual perspective, we are all infinite souls, never dying, never born. Our essence is not our material form. A young child might be an ancient soul. Who is to know? What I am certain about is that teaching any afflicted child to adamantly refuse to think of him or herself as limited in any way, and to help them to see that their spirit is perfect and always connected to God, regardless of their body's impairment, is the way to implement a spiritual solution in the mind of any young person. It is in such teachings that pardon is brought to the presence of injury and will facilitate the healing process. Healing is the state of consciousness in which you allow God to flow through you to the injury and to the injured. All illness, metaphysically speaking, is the result of disconnecting from God in our minds and bodies. While I am not disparaging the medical community in any way, I am suggesting that it is not doctors or medicines or therapy that heals anyone. Every physician friend I know acknowledges the inexplicably awesome power of the body to heal itself. They know there is a power at work that they cannot see or touch, a power that is pure spiritual energy. There are no imperfect bodies, only ideas that people have which reinforce their separateness from God. These imperfect ideas are the ego at work, creating a mindset that we are unable to heal ourselves or others. 
an idea that says I have arthritis or migraine headaches and there's nothing I can do about it. I am stiff and in constant pain because of these afflictions, rather than thinking which says I have these afflictions because of the imperfect ideas I have about my body. If you want a truly healthy body, make your mind vigorous, loving, healthy, and positive, and your body will respond accordingly. Moreover, you will be able to bring this attitude of healing to everyone you encounter. There is a healer in you, rooted in and always connected to spirit. To know this healer and to make it work in your life and the lives of others, you must get your ego out of the way. Remember, the definition of ego is that it is nothing more than an idea that you carry around that identifies you as separate from everyone else and as the sum total of your accomplishments and acquisitions. Your ego is what you must transcend in order to know the truth of healing. All things proceed from mind, and taming your ego's demands is no exception. Your body can become a perfect instrument of your thoughts as long as you are continuously on the alert for removing thoughts of impending illness and the expectation of injury. The idea that a disease is incurable or an injury unfixable is tantamount to saying to God, I give up on you and on myself as an extension of you as well. When we rid ourselves of the ideas that create the illusions of our diseases, we open ourselves to the potential for creating perfect health. I prefer to think of any disease or injury problem in terms of energy. When your body is immobilized in any way, it is due to frequencies that are incompatible with your higher frequencies of perfect health as created by spirit. In those higher frequencies, there is no room for the idea of something being incurable. Letting go of the concept of incurable allows you to truly move into the realm of perfect harmonious energy, which is what is meant by spiritual consciousness, and to realize that there is nothing in God consciousness that wants us to be warped or injured or plagued by disease. To witness healing is a miraculous event, and it takes place daily in a myriad of ways. A blemish disappears as healing invigorates the skin. Symptoms of a cold that lingered suddenly have no impact on you. Your nose stops running. Your temperature returns to normal. Your upset stomach is soothed and your broken finger mends. All of this, quote, healing is nothing more than a return to wholeness. Your thoughts have a lot to do with this healing process. Your thoughts and low energy patterns can activate an ulcer and so can they activate the flow of chi to remove that imbalance. The mind-body connection is real, but the God-body connection is the essence of all healing. Now you might ask, why did St. Francis die of tuberculosis and why did Jesus die on a cross and why do saints die if they are in touch with this highest energy of wholeness? When St. Francis was asked why he didn't heal himself of his terminal illnesses, he replied, I want everyone to know that it is not me who does the healing. If you know that healing is nothing more than God-realization, and you abandon all thoughts of being separate from that consciousness, including fear of illness and death, then you create an energy field for rejoining with spirit. This is healing, and St. Francis asks you through his prayer to be an instrument of this process. Anyone can become a healer who understands that he or she is merely a channel through which perfect spiritual love can flow. When you touch the illness of another with the energy of spirit or the source, you facilitate the healing process. I visited a young man in a hospital in Canada who had been in a serious motorcycle accident and was lying comatose. Several of his friends asked if I would visit him since he was a big fan of my writing and tapes and had been unable to attend my presentation in Toronto due to his near-fatal accident several days prior to my visit. On my way to the airport, I went to see Anthony in the intensive care unit of the hospital. The nurses said there was very little chance that he would survive his wounds. He was surrounded by the energy of injury. The other patients on the ward were in various states of total disrepair. Anthony lay there, 25 years old, unconscious, and in a place where little hope for healing was being offered. I spent one hour with Anthony, making every effort to be a channel through which healing might flow. I stayed in deep conscious contact through meditation with God and visualized white light surrounding this young man. When I left, I had a strong knowing that Anthony would recover. Sure enough, 18 months later, I was speaking at a convention and Anthony appeared. He looked and sounded fit and told us he was almost totally recovered. When he addressed the group at my request, he described coming out of the coma and being told by the nurses of my visit. They said I had prayed and seemed almost lost in my own bliss as I walked around his bed during my visit. As you know, it was not I, this ego or my body, that had anything to do with Anthony's recovery. I merely brought spiritual consciousness to his injury. 
Anthony now uses his own healing journey as a metaphor for teaching others. The only thing I was totally committed to in my visit was to stay in the highest energy pattern I could and to refuse to give credibility to a second power called injury. Approach any experience of injury, whether it be in yourself or others, with a mindset of high hopes for release from that injury. Immerse yourself in the literature of healing. Read and listen to stories of miraculous cures, healings, and the glory of all that is right with the world. Continuously reinforce in yourself the idea that humanity is good, that the sick can be healed, that the injured can be pardoned. There are a million acts of kindness for every act of violence in the world. Don't encourage injury by providing extra special love and attention for the sickness. This applies to the treatment of others as well as yourself. Avoid giving yourself and others a reason to continue being sick. Don't make the occurrence of illness the only time you give loving attention. Sickness and love can become associated. When a person, particularly a child, wants love, they erroneously may think becoming sick is the way to get it. Take the view that the sickness itself is not real. Treat it just like you would treat any other illusion as something that really doesn't belong in your consciousness or the consciousness of the injured. I find that people who experience a great deal of injury and illness in their lives appear to enjoy telling everyone about their maladies. When these people begin to tell me how proud they are of their maladies, I respond with indifference to the sickness itself. You don't have to live with this pain, I suggest. You're stronger than any disease. I don't give the energy any credibility. I treat my family and myself in this way as well. My wife and I have just naturally sent our children messages that they are more powerful than any disease process. When you stop reinforcing injury with love and use your love to reinforce pardoning, healing replaces sickness quite quickly. You can do all of this if you become a person who is open to the idea of being able to use your higher capacities to help restore the natural loving harmony of the body. Keep beauty always near you and feel the healing power of God's natural harmonious world. Allow yourself to fully experience and enjoy flowers, sunsets, and sunrises, mountains, beaches, and spiritual literature. I suggest you open yourself to as much beautiful music as possible. Detach yourself from your thoughts of anger, bitterness, or self-pity, and love your body as the temple that God gave you to house your soul on this journey. The process of letting go and refusing to harbor thoughts of illness will bring a calm, healing energy to you in the moment and this peace will be your reward for letting go. The use of the word pardon by St. Francis could also be construed to imply the willingness to extend forgiveness to any and all who may have injured you in any way, not just bodily. The ability to extend forgiveness becomes natural when you don't carry hate within you. Whenever you feel that someone has injured you or sullied your reputation or caused you physical harm, the spiritual solution, as difficult as it may appear, is to extend forgiveness. To hold on to the pain and seek revenge will simply keep you stuck in pain. The old Chinese proverb states this better than I do. If you're going to seek revenge, you'd better dig two graves. Practice letting go of injured feelings with love and pardon, and the spiritual solutions to most of your problems will be activated. I often use the mango exercise to illustrate that faith is impossible to have without a direct experience. When speaking to a large audience, I invite someone who has never tasted a mango to volunteer for a little experiment. Then I ask people who have tasted a mango to tell the volunteer exactly how a mango tastes. As each person attempts to convey the flavor of a mango, they realize how fruitless their efforts are. The conclusion is that it is impossible to convey this information in words. The mango tasting exercise is analogous to your ability to have faith where there is doubt. Just as you cannot know the taste of a mango unless you have the experience of eating a mango, you cannot know faith without having had an experience of God. It is impossible to bring faith to the presence of doubt until you abandon the idea of knowing God through the words or experiences of others. You must make a concentrated effort to know the highest and fastest frequencies of spiritual energy through your own means of establishing conscious contact. Once you know this spiritual consciousness yourself, you will not even entertain the possibility of doubt. You will strive to live more and more at the spiritual level, where you have access to this knowing at all times. This knowing is what I call faith, and it cannot be substantiated or verified by external sources.
Why would you live with any doubts about your ability to access spirit in times of trouble or the presence of problems? The answer lies in understanding the difference between what you believe and what you know. Beliefs stem from the experiences and testimony of others, who in one way or another have attempted to persuade you of their truths. All of your institutional religious training and theological dogma may be valid. Nevertheless, they are usually presented as the truth for all, including you. The pressures to believe may have been almost insurmountable if you were assigned these beliefs at birth and raised on them. Any method of conditioning people to accept beliefs about God creates doubt, because the beliefs do not come from any direct experience of God. You have faith that you can ride a bicycle not because of the testimony of others, but because you have made conscious contact with bicycle riding. Your experience has provided you with faith in this endeavor. It is not because of any evidence that has been presented to you verifying the existence of balance laws, or even because everyone else around you is riding their bicycles. It is your knowing, because of your direct experience, that gives you faith.